So a very warm welcome to everybody this evening for our lecture with Dr. Louise Fenton on voodoo, fact or fiction. Um, my name is Paula Harrison and I'm the coordinator at University Centre Telford. We're part of the University of Wolverhampton um, and we're based in Telford in the heart of Shropshire. Um, we would normally hold our public lecture programme in our centre and invite um, obviously a lot of local people from Shropshire but because of the current pandemic we've had to move our lectures online and this has obviously been really exciting because it's meant that we've um, had a global um, reach and Louise's lecture last week meant that we had people from 17 different countries um, take part which is just phenomenal um, so really really exciting now before i hand over to louise just to explain that there is a q and a bottom uh, button at the bottom of your screen if you're using a desktop um, and louise will answer the questions i'll read them out um, and louise will answer them in order um, at the end of the lecture if you're using a mobile device uh, the q and a button will be in the top right hand corner um, so hopefully that's all okay. So it's the Q&A button and I've noticed that we, we've got a question already. Hopefully everybody has joined okay. Um, just to welcome Louise as well, as, as well as everybody who's joined us tonight. Um, Louise is a cultural historian, illustrator and writer. She has a BA and an MA in illustration from the University of Wolverhampton. She completed her PhD on the representations of voodoo at the University of Warwick in 2010. Louise is now a senior lecturer in contextual studies at the University of Wolverhampton. Her recent research has been focused on the visual and literary representations of otherness and the social history of witchcraft, voodoo and zombies. So a very warm welcome again to Louise and I'll hand over to you now for your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you Paula and thank you to you and all your staff for the support I've had in doing these talks. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, this is a very strange situation because although you're online I just want to reiterate the fact I can't see any of you so if you're making cups of tea or wandering around that's fine I, I don't know. So um, thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight's lecture is on voodoo, fact or fiction and what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit um, it is a basic overview. There is no way I can delve deeply into this religion as it's complex, it's multifaceted, it's fascinating, it's mysterious, um, but I can't do it all in a half hour lecture. So please forgive me if I miss anything. Do feel free to email me. I'm just going to share my screen for the start of the lecture. So hopefully this will work. Um, you should now have my slide in front of you, I hope. Mm -hmm. It's not showing as a slideshow for some reason. There we go. So as you can see on this screen, my email is there, louise.fenton at wlv.ac.uk. If after the lecture you find you have a question, please don't hesitate to contact me. I took quite a few emails last week. If everybody does, give me a few days to get back to you, but I will answer any email questions afterwards, as well as the Q&A we're doing after the lecture. So I'm going to talk about voodoo in Haiti and voodoo as we probably think we know it. First of all, the spelling. Voodoo, 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 voodoo. Bodun. These are just five spellings. During my research, I've probably come across 15 or 16. If you've got a spare half hour, you could try variations of the spelling. There are several of them. Um, but it's down to interpretation. It's down to misunderstanding, language barriers. So in different readings you might look at, if you are interested and you read articles about voodoo, you will see several spellings. So the purposes of tonight and generally voodoo, the one on the left, V-O-O-D-O-O, is akin to the religion as it's practiced in West Africa today. We refer to many West African beliefs as voodoo. We also believe 
the beliefs in New Orleans and Louisiana. We call that voodoo. But it's also a term that's been generalized and used for stereotypes, as in the image below it, with the death and frightening image and the little doll. That's the more popularized and stereotyped version of voodoo. The correct spelling for Haitian voodoo, the religion, is V O D O U. This is the preferred term and it's what I'm going to use. So if I'm talking about the religion, I will talk about it as voodoo. If I'm talking about the more popular culture versions, it will be voodoo, just to clarify. Now, I know you can't answer me and I can't see you. However, when you think of the word voodoo, what do you think of when you hear the word? I'm sure when you saw this lecture, many of you had an impression of what it is. I'm sure we've got some in the audience who are quite um, knowledgeable about the religion. However, when you hear the word voodoo, what does it mean to you? And where has your understanding come from? For me, mine started well, 20 years ago, which I'll talk about in a minute. But what I want to say first is what voodoo is not. Voodoo is not a cult. It's not black magic and it's not devil worship. Sorry to disappoint. People who practice are not witch doctors, they're not sorcerers, they're not occultists. It's not widely practiced with the intention to harm or to possess or control people, even though Hollywood have you believe that. The intention is mainly to heal. Most voodooists have never seen a voodoo doll. They wouldn't know what one was. It's not morbid and it's not violent. It's not the same everywhere and it's not the same for everyone. It evolves and adapts to situations, to circumstances, to cultures, to place. And people who actually practice voodoo would say that they are serving the spirits or they're in service. They wouldn't say that they're voodooists. So I'm often asked, how did I get involved in voodoo? How did it all start? And I'm going to cover that today because it's always one of the questions. My own understanding came from the 1960s cartoon series, Scooby-Doo. One of my favorites still is today. And I was so pleased that I could feature Scooby-Doo in my PhD. In the, ver in the episode, Which Witch is Witch? We have a witch, a zombie, mentions of Haiti, voodoo dolls, pins in dolls, and it's this eclectic mix of all things weird and wonderful that led me to believe that, you know, they're all interlinked. And then moving on to the 1970s, the iconic James Bond film, Live and Let Die, which I'm sure a majority of you will know. And a majority of you will have your understanding of voodoo from this very film. I did an MA in illustration in the late 1990s. And during that time, I was fortunate to go on holiday to the Dominican Republic where I met an artist and he was from Haiti. And we talked through broken language, but we managed to speak a little bit. And what he told me about voodoo was not what I understood it to be. And I realized that my understanding was from these sources, very popular culture based. And it made, it sparked my interest. I wanted to know what was voodoo really about? And that's how I became involved. It just grabbed my attention. So I then began researching, moving on to do a PhD, which was completely on the representations of voodoo um, based on Haitian voodoo. And I looked at cinema, literature, television, theatre, animation and art. So I looked across the board at how did we and how did popular culture construct our understanding of voodoo? Stereotypes abound, and these are the key ones that always appear. Baron Samdi on the top left is from Live and Let Die. The maniacal laughter at the end of the movie where he sat on the back of the train where he's been shot and killed and shot and fallen in with snakes and died and resurrected. Iconic. And this is our knowledge of Baron Samdi. Underneath is from um, The Princess and the Frog, a Disney film set in New Orleans. Top right, the voodoo doll with the pins, of course and bottom right is a scene from Night of the Living Dead with the zombies. Now I know, I know this will be 
of key interest to a lot of you and I haven't got the time to discuss zombies. I think that's a whole other talk that I might have to speak to Paula about scheduling in. But zombies is part of Haitian culture. It's part of our popular culture understanding. I just haven't got the time to go into it this evening. So I'm sorry if that was what you were hoping on, but I'm going to tell you now about how voodoo evolved in Haiti. So, as you can see on this image, the West African coast is highlighted in slight yellow, and that's the main source of the slave trade and the supply of slaves. The orange that's going transatlantic is showing the percentage of slaves and where they were heading for, and most of them were heading for the West Indies. Now this area you can see in the centre, this was ruled by the Fon people, and it was the Empire of Dahomey. And that covers what we know today as Togo, Benin and Nigeria, which you can see just above Ghana in the middle. Most of the Haitian slaves were taken from Dahomey, but there were also some of the Yoruba people which were taken from the empire of Oyo, which was just next to Dahomey. So that's predominantly where they came from. In the 1700s, Dahomey was a really powerful nation. It was a, a strong empire and they were selling their own people as slaves to the slave trade. Um, they, most of their sales were the undesirables. They were their criminals and also interestingly, a lot of their priests. They were so concerned that the priests of West African belief systems were a threat to the empire and to the power so they wanted rid of them so they shipped out many priests along with the criminals but it was quite lucrative it was very lucrative however Dahomey began to wane in the 1800s as the slave trade finally ceased France took over the area and eventually it became a colony of France and it was called Benin which we know today the word voodoo actually comes from the Fon language and it means spirit or God. The West Africans practiced a religion which was fostered, uh, it was fostering a personal relationship between the personal and ancestral spirits along with spirits of nature. So the main elements, earth, fire, air and water. So this was how they believed their spirits worked. And these beliefs formed the foundation of Haitian voodoo. Most of them came from this area. The most powerful West African spirits became the most important spirits in Haitian voodoo. And they were called Rada. They were called the Rada Pantheon, which I'll talk about in a minute. They were the Haitians' primary link to their traditions and their homeland. That's all they got left. They'd lost their identity, they'd lost their culture, but they, they could hang on to their beliefs. So where is Haiti? For those of you who don't know, it's in the Caribbean, in the Greater Antilles. And if you look, you've got Cuba to the left in an orange colour, Jamaica just below it, and then to the right of that in yellow is Haiti. It's part of an island which is now called Hispaniola, which was called San Domingue in the past, and it's linked to Dominican Republic. So Dominican Republic is still Spanish and Haiti was French. I say was because I'll talk about a little bit of um, the history. So that's where it is. Haiti wasn't the only culture that um, had a religion that evolved from slavery. Many other areas of the Caribbean did too. So for example, there's Santeria in Cuba, Condomble in Brazil, um, Obia in Jamaica. And these are all very similar. They're syncretic religions where different beliefs are brought and forced together to create new, new belief system. Voodoo in Haiti developed from the 16th century right the way through to the 18th century. On arrival, this is now talking a little bit about how, how it evolved. So on arrival, the slaves, slaves arrived, they were frequently and forcibly baptised into the Catholic faith. And they had to do this within eight days. Missionaries had been in Haiti since the early 1700s and felt that by baptising them as Catholics, it was a way to civilise 
and I'm using this in inverted commas, to civilise the savages, and that's written repeatedly in documents of the time. They felt that by adopting a more Christian religion, they would forego their beliefs. However, what did happen was that Catholicism just became a camouflage for the African beliefs. So voodoo and voodoo started to evolve underneath the Catholic faith. The plantation owners weren't so keen on their slaves being baptised as Catholics because it meant that they had to be given time to worship, which the plantation owners were not happy with. However, what the slaves did was then use songs, use the prayers within their own belief system and Vodou evolved. There were other influences on the evolution of Vodou. It wasn't just the West African beliefs. There were a very few, because most were slaughtered in colonisation, but there were a few of the indigenous peoples, the Taino and the Caribs, who also brought new spirits, new beliefs and new religious objects to Vodou. So there's this syncretic, which is an, an amalgamation of all of these different belief systems. And a lot of this um, idea of baptism into the Catholic faith was as much about fear as it was about control. But if you think about the volume of slaves and the number of the white people in power, they needed some way of control. Now what happened, each of the Catholic saints were adopted and appropriated for voodoo spirits. So each of the spirits has got its Catholic counterpart. These are just two of them. So on the left, this is a painting from Haiti, a village in Haiti, of St. Peter. St. Peter holds the keys to heaven. He's believed to be the gatekeeper. And he is associated with Papa Legba. And Papa Legba holds, he stands at crossroads and he is the gatekeeper between the material and the spiritual world. On the right, we've got an image of St. Patrick, who is believed to have driven all snakes out of Ireland. And he is associated with Dambala, whose image is also serpents. He's represented by serpents and snakes. This, the one on the right is one of the Vodou flags, which I'll talk about in a little while. But it, each of them, every, Catholic saint, there is a voodoo counterpart. So each of the spirits was hidden. And these images could be talked about and worshipped with the slaves knowing that they were talking about their spirits, but the plantation owners believing they were talking about Catholic deities. So the belief system in voodoo, it recognises one supreme being. They believe in God, a God. And bon Dieu is the Creole for le bon Dieu, which is the French for the good God. So this is the all powerful God at the top, totally untouchable. He's a divine, it's a he, he's a divine essence and he's found in every part of creation. So he's found in spirits, in people, in the animate, in the inanimate, he's in human, mankind it's the voodooist believes that born jay created man in his image but he's too great to be directly involved in day-to-day -day life they believe in god's will but they don't believe that they're close enough they're too detached from him to be able to ask for help but the spirits they have a personal relationship with he's out of reach and to connect with the spiritual world it's believed that born jay created the lower who are the assigned spirits to deal with day to day. This is spelled LWA, sometimes you might see it spelled LOA, but they're the Lua. And the Lua oversee everything in life, marriage, birth, death, work, celebrations, commiserations, everything in day to day life is overseen by the Lua. And the Lua are ancestral spirits or spirits of nature. So again, they're linked to earth, wind, fire, air, water, as well as spirits of the dead, because it's believed that your ancestors acquired knowledge, wisdom, and that they don't go away. They're there to be called upon when needed. The bottom part where you can see Rada and Petro, these are the Nansha or the rites, sometimes referred to as the pantheons. And these are the groups of the spirits, groups of the lower. 
Radha is the most popular and these relate to Dahomey. These relate to the spirits from Dahomey. They are the largest of the rites and most books I've read, it's a binary, it, they're Radha or Petro, but there are many others and it's believed there could be as many as 15, but because Voodoo is an oral tradition, nothing's written down. We've only got to listen and we can only talk to people. And some of these pantheon or rites are so small, only a very small amount of people know about them. And so they're not widely known by the West. So we've got Radha from Dahomey. Petro evolved in Haiti, and this is seen as the dark side of Voodoo. Um, it's the Petro rites that are believed to be linked to zombification, to war, to um, anything that's to harm, to cause pain. That's the Petro rites. And as in everything, there's good and evil. However, the Rada rites are the ones that are usually used. But there are others. Congo originates in Congo. Ibo and Nago are both from Yoruba people. Guinean is from Guinea, Bambara from Sudan, Bangal is from Angola, and Siniga is from Senegal. So we have this whole pantheon of spirits. Some of the lower, um, they obviously have a name. They then have what they represent and the image that's associated with them in, in imagery. So if you see paintings of serpents, you know it's related to Dambala. If you see a rainbow, you know it's related to Aida Wido, and that's for fertility. Papa Legba, who looks at the gateways, he's represented by a cross. Ogu is war, fire and metalwork, and he holds a machete. Azili Frida is love and beauty, represented by a heart. Baron Samdi, the most common and most frequently seen, represents death, and his is cross, coffins or a phallus. Azaka, also known as Singaka, Sinzaka, He's for agriculture and he seemed to be carrying a big bag. It's called a makut. It's a soft bag that goes over the shoulder. Or bosu, male fertility and black magic um, from the Petro rites. And his is a ball. So you can see just some of them. They also have a colour associated with them. They have offerings associated with them. And they do have sacrifices, animal sacrifices suggested for each one. So where do these ceremonies take place? Anywhere. Um, in the 21st century, they might take place in a basement in a New York apartment. They might take place in a field in rural Haiti, even in the Dominican Republic. A lot of, a lot of people have now moved over to the Dominican Republic. But most of the time and traditionally, they take place in what's called a peristyle. And that's a building with usually a corrugated roof in the centre of a village. It's a focal point, like a community centre. Inside the peristyle is a potomitan, and that's this central pole, and that's in everyone. Sometimes it's square, usually round, but the potomitan, which you can see on the left image, which painted green and white, is the central focus, and that's believed to be the link between the spiritual and the material world. Always in some form is the one of those. On the right, you can see a veve, and this is a drawing that's done in cornflower, chalk, ash, talcum powder, whatever's handy. It's drawn prior to a ceremony and links specifically to one lower. So the ceremony generally is to ask for a lower and the purpose of it is to bring the spirit to the material world. The voodooists believe that if they evoke a spirit, it will ride one of them. It's known as riding, but it possesses them. And they believe that somebody within the congregation will be possessed and they then take on the characteristics of that particular lower. So for example this one on the right is for Baron Samdi, you've got the cross which is symbolic um, of death and he, he is one of the spirits of the dead. He's also very arrogant, he's quite sexual, so if he was the spirit that possessed one of the congregation you would expect them to be very cocky, to be very arrogant, to be strutting around, to be quite lewd in their suggestions. He often smokes cigars, he likes a drop of rum, you can see the rum bottles there. And when he possesses, then they know that it's been successful. The start of the ceremony is the drummers. The drummers set the pace. Initially, in many places, the ceremony would start with an almost a small procession of the Vodou flags, which are known as the Drapo Voodoo which are sequin flags 
in some some academics believe they represent the stained glass windows of catholic churches some believe they're just decorative um, and are designed to evoke the spirit so they're designed in the form of the spirit they're brought in at the start and waved so the procession starts the drummers then begin the drum beat builds the pace now some of these ceremonies can go on for 12 hours i was one i was at one in new orleans which was nearly 14 hours long so it started at lunchtime and went on till the early hours of the morning so they can be very long very very long but it builds and the idea is this this momentum brings the spirit so you've got the veve on the floor you've got the dancers you've got the chanting you've got the drumming going and it builds and builds until somebody was finally possessed now there are sacrifices and this is a real contentious issue sacrifice does take place in voodoo as it does in many other religions it's not in isolation with voodoo however as we move forward there are two reasons why it's on decline firstly poverty in Haiti is rife and to sacrifice an animal is an incredible expense. They do so for very important things and what happens after the sacrifice, they would then cook the animal and it would feed the whole village so it's not wasted. However, work I've done in New Orleans indicates that many voodoo priestesses and priests are now vegetarian or really do not agree to sacrifice and so they find alternative offerings it may be another food stuff it may be um, perfume or rum or tobacco um, dolls it could be anything else but they find alternatives and it seems to keep the spirits happy white in images you see of voodoo ceremonies and most of the ones i show people are wearing white and the reason is is because it's for um, purity and modesty, but it's also linked to the beliefs from Dahomey. It's the spirits, it's sacred to the spirits of Dahomey. However, as you can see from this image, much more relaxed these days. Many participants are in jeans and t-shirts and anything goes. And people are very open. In New Orleans on Halloween, if you're ever lucky enough to go, there are voodoo ceremonies which are accessible to the public and they are very welcoming. In Haiti, a little less so. As I go on in a moment, I will talk a bit about the oppression and you'll understand why. You will sometimes see voodooists wearing blue or red and that's symbolic of the, the Haitian flag, which is red, blue with the coat of arms in the middle. Altars are also part of Haitian voodoo. This one is to, for several different spirits. As you can see, the Catholic saints are at the back and lots of colours are hanging on the, the, the altar. And most people have an affinity to one particular spirit or lower. So they would have a very small altar in their home or in their garden. I now want to talk a little bit about the history because Haiti and Vodou played a pivotal role in the independence of Haiti. Vodou was inspiration for the slaves to revolt in 1791. They'd had enough, they were oppressed and they were, I'm sorry if you, by the way, I can hear somebody knocking my front door. So if you can hear that, I really apologize. I'm not going to answer it. I just apologize if you can hear it. This was the first and only successful slave rebellion in history. The whole fight for independence began with a voodoo ceremony. They evoked the Petro rites. They slaughtered a black pig. They brought together as much power as they could. And this was the inspiration for the slaves to stand up and rebel against their oppressors. And they did. And after a long, long struggle and battle, they won. And it was independence on the 1st of January, 1804. Haiti was an independent republic broken away from white colonial rule. However, voodoo has been continually suppressed since then, and I'm now going to talk a little bit about why. In the eyes of the West in the 19th century, any element of African culture smacked to barbarism. Racism was integral to the West. No African culture could be deemed anything other than savage. In Haiti, the agitators who emerged from this amazing rebellion and independence struggle 
were used as proof across the West of the relationship between voodoo and savagery. It's often referred to in newspapers and books how it's the savages and the voodoo that caused this to happen. It, it was unbelievable. The West and the white could not believe this. And this continued. Racist notions of black sensationalism and the practice of voodoo sold newspapers, it sold books. And it meant that these rumors were spread and exaggerated misconceptions. And it promoted a view of black people as, especially in Haiti, as superstitious, as savages and inferior to whites. And that's what it was all about. This book was notorious, published first in 1884 and revised in 1889, even more sensational, was by Suspensa Sinjan, who was a Victorian envoy to Haiti. And in his book, he writes extensively of cannibalism and of sacrifice, human sacrifice, which was often referred to as the long pig. And this was all based on an account of a young girl who went missing in Haiti. And several people went searching for her, uh, it was written about. And then after it escalated and more and more people were looking for her, they found her remains. And it was reported in the Western press that she'd been cannibalized and they'd eaten her, they'd sacrificed her and eaten her. He picked up on this, but every account in his book is that he'd spoken to somebody who'd spoken to somebody who'd heard about. There was never any evidence of any cannibalism on Haiti ever since records began in the late 17th century. No evidence whatsoever. But he also wrote about how Christianity could help save the Haitians. In the early 1900s, there was a calamitous political situation in Haiti. They were in a real problem situation. It resulted in 1915 of the lynching of their president. That's how serious it was. But voodoo was used as an excuse. A previous US minister who was working in Haiti wrote to the US government and stated that the president who was lynched shortly afterwards and his family were devotees of voodoo. And therefore Haiti could not govern itself. America needed to step in and goodness me did they step in. In 1915, they colonized again. They went in and took over Haiti. It was called the American Occupation. It lasted from 1915 to 1934. And during this time, they enforced the legal prohibition of voodoo. So although a century before Haiti gained its independence, they were now being oppressed once again. And it was during this time that more lurid accounts were coming out in published form written and widely circulated by people who were deemed to be truthful and honest. They were serving military. They couldn't be lying about what was going on in Haiti. The book on the left is a Marine who was crowned king on La Gonave, which is a little island off the coast of Haiti. And in it, he often talks about how he's sympathetic with the people, how he understands how they feel after gaining independence and then being um, occupied by the US forces. However, voodoo needs to be eradicated at any cost and he vividly discusses different missions that he goes on. In the one on the right, this is called Cannibal Cousins by John Craig. He mentions a voodoo doll for one of the first accounts where we talk, of, we actually read about a doll with pins in it. Probably sensationalised, I would say. Um, there's very little evidence of dolls in Haiti or voodoo, which I will talk about later. But the biggest problem for Haiti was the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church did not accept voodoo and systematically ran anti-superstition campaigns where the church was supported by the military, the police and the government to eradicate voodoo completely from the island. What's really surprised me when I found out about these is how little I'd known about them. They took place in 1896, 1912, 1913, 1925, 1930, 1940, 
1941, and most recently, and this really shocked me, 1986. This was a systematic persecution of Vodou practitioners. And what they did was to raid any Vodou temples. So any Vodou temples or peristyles that were in existence, they raided them. They burned ceremonial objects. Thousands and thousands of objects have been lost over time. They cut down sacred trees. Trees were often adorned with ribbons and with offerings, gone. They imprisoned Vodou priests or lynched and executed them on the spot accidentally because they weren't supposed to. And they slaughtered followers. Many, many, well, thousands were killed in the name of religion. And this is under the guidance of the Catholic Church. It's, it's impossible to think that within the last century this occurred. The worst one was in 1941 when they swept from one side of the country to the other trying to totally destroy it, but they failed. They did not stamp out Vodou. They did not eradicate it, but they did drive it underground. And when you think the latest anti-superstition campaign was as, as recent as 1986, this is why Haitians are very suspicious of people from the West interested in their culture and wanting to see a ceremony or a sensationalized image of their, their religion. This painting is just one of, um, from 1995, illustrating the superstition campaign. So as well as those persecutions from authorities, Voodoo was receiving its Hollywood treatment. Misrepresentations in books and articles had been published, including there was one which I haven't got a cover of, um, William Seabrook's Magic Island, which was utilised as a foundation for plays, for cinema, for novels, and it caught the public imagination. This exotic island in the Caribbean filled with this otherness, this mysticism of Vodou, of the walking dead, of strange practices. White Zombie was released in 1932, Bella Lugosi, highlighted here as Bella Dracula Lugosi. It did attempt authenticity and it's one of the only Vodou or Voodoo now cinema performances where they try and link Haiti with Voodoo. There are mentions of how it evolved in Haiti, it talks about being set in Haiti, it talks about zombies, it talks about voodoo. Interestingly, there's an opening scene where they talk about the West Indies belonging to us and it's a white couple, um, no mention of the independence or the revolution. But white zombie grabbed attention. Interestingly, the zombie in this one is a white female but worth a watch, worth, definitely worth a watch. But in 1943, I Walked With a Zombie was released. It was loosely, and I say very loosely because I still can't see the connection, based on Jane Eyre. If you want to watch it and try and make the links, please do. But it was supposed to be linked to give it some credibility. But the iconography in it came from images of Haiti through the American occupation, through travel accounts. The zombie in this is quite benign. He's helpful. He's trying to protect the white zombie who is um, possessed. It's showing that all the malicious cursing and spells is created by a white woman. It's a very interesting twist, but this was really the end. These two offerings were the only two that tried to authenticate voodoo. It then became voodoo and from the 19, late 1960s onwards took on a whole different meaning with zombies and all the other cultural appropriations. Stereotypes abound in the 60s and 70s, as I mentioned earlier. This is a still from one of the Scooby-Doo episodes with the little dolls with the pins stuck in them, and they, they refer to it as voodoo. The iconic Baron Samdi in the graveyard in Live and Let Die. So this had really, with literature, from the turn of the century through to the 1930s, Hollywood from the 1930s, popular culture then through to the 70s. It really shaped what we thought and what we think of as voodoo. With voodoo being driven underground and not being widely known about, it's not surprising that our understanding and misconceptions are there. It, it, no reason why they shouldn't be. 
It was finally accepted as a religion in 1987. The Vatican finally conceded that with over 10 million followers worldwide, in well in excess of 10 million followers, voodoo would finally be deemed a religion. And that's 1987, which to me is mind blowing. But it's been practiced worldwide. It's widely practiced in the US and Haiti, but the diaspora is global. I'm just going to talk a little bit now about the visual culture because art and visual culture are part and parcel of voodoo. There's no written text, but there's so many images that tell so many stories. And I just want to share some with you. This is a community building in Haiti. You can see all the references to voodoo, to history, to life in a Haitian village. In the 1940s, art in Haiti was discovered, even though it had been happening for years, it was discovered. And Hector Hippolyte, Hippolyte is a voodoo priest, but he's an artist and he believes he's led by the spirit. So all of his paintings are related to the Loa or are directed by the Loa. Highly collectible now, his work fetches for great sums of money, but he's in collections around the world. And he really helped to bring art to the fore from Haiti. Andre Pierre, Matres La Sirene of the Sweet Waters by Andre Pierre. In this one, you can see the little altar for Baron Samdi, but you can see the Veve are painted across. And La Sirene is um, a mermaid, a spirit of the water. But these beautiful pictures, again, Andre Pierre believes he is led by the spirits. These are two of the Vodou flags, sometimes referred to as replacement stained glass windows. They shimmer with colour, widely available um, even today. Some of the more well-known artists are obviously fetching great figures, but you can pick these up. <coughs> Excuse me. The Veve, intricately drawn patterns on the floor. This one is for Azili. Transient, disappear, so we've only got photographs. Obviously, there's loads of drawings now and they're incorporated in paintings, but the actual Veve are on the ground and are then dispersed. The Pake Congo, um, these relate back to the Congo. They're believed to hold spirits. They're believed to be very powerful. There's spells made in them to relate to people in power usually, but they, in Congo in particular, they're very powerful and quite sinister. In Haiti, less so. They're more for positive energy. Of course the altars, offerings to the different spirits, this one is predominantly for, well we've got Baron Samdi with the coffins but we've also got Azuli who is represented by um, Mary and you can see the skulls which all relate to the Baron and black and red which are his colours and rum bottles I spot. And they're both inside buildings and outside. This again is a street altar, which people can just make offerings to. They're there, they're for everybody's use. There's no discretion about who can and can't use them. Also metalwork, calling on the spirits, the lower. Um, Georges Lyotard was very, very popular in the 40s and 50s. He made these beautiful iron crosses. Unfortunately, most of them were stolen when he became popular. Um, but some do still adorn cemeteries around Haiti and he also makes a lot of metalwork and metalwork sculptures are indigenous to Haiti. Odu, during and following the revolution in Haiti, some French plantation owners fled to Louisiana and in particular New Orleans and you can find Voodoo and New Orleans go hand in hand. And if any of you have been lucky enough to go, you know that in the French Quarter, it's voodoo everything. Food, um, souvenirs, shops, everything is around voodoo. But the Historic Voodoo Museum does hold genuine artefacts and um, does try and convey. And there are working altars in there and they have ceremonies. It's very different and it's known as voodoo in New Orleans. But voodoo continues to sustain its strength and its, its presence. And when the French plantation owners took their slaves to Louisiana and New Orleans, it then they met up with the Cajuns and other cultures and then voodoo changed again. And that's how it is. And I couldn't end without mentioning the voodoo doll. 
there's very little mention of voodoo dolls in Haitian voodoo. Apart from the odd occasional reference for healing, and then I came across these dolls which were photographed in Haiti in the 1980s and 1990s, and all three of them have been made to heal, not to harm. Not a pin in sight, just purely for healing purposes, to channel positive energy. In New Orleans, a slightly different story. The ones on the left you will find everywhere. They come with a black pin and a white pin. You're invited to buy them. They're only about a dollar each or two dollars. And you can stab them and think of doing harm or good to people. Uh, and if you look closely, you can see the made in China. So not really authentic, but massive selling, selling point for tourists. The one on the right is an authentic doll. It's actually my own. And this one was made by a priestess. It's representative of the lower of the dead, um, but a female one called Mama Bridget, who is also the matriarch of the dead and for lost women in your families. Um, and she is just beautiful. And that that is more what you would expect to find as a New Orleans voodoo doll, not the little things on the left. Okay, so I'm going to finish by just sharing a little bit of a sound bite of, it's only 30 seconds, but this gives you an idea of what it sounds like at a voodoo ceremony in New Orleans. They're painting the veve on the floor with chalk ready for uh, Baron Sandy, but I hope it gives you a sound, it's the, the atmosphere. <laughs> So I hope that you've learned something from this. Um, it was a very whistled stop and a very superficial explanation of what voodoo is. Um, but I do hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned a little bit of something about voodoo and voodoo. Uh, it's been my absolute pleasure. So if you've got any questions, then please start typing into the Q&A. If we run out of time, please feel free to contact me after the event and I will do my best. But I hope it's shown you that Vodou is colourful, it's celebratory, and it's not anything to do with the macabre and the sinister and death and destruction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. That was wonderful. Really fascinating. Thank you. We've got um, several questions already. Um, and if I just um, read them out for you. The first one um, is from Charlene. Is sat satanic worshipping and santeria? an offshoot of voodoo or voodoo. Okay, okay. Um, Santeria is found in Cuba and it's very similar. It's, it's the same sort of process. It was the slaves that came from West Africa were then displaced to Cuba. So they then formed their syncretic religion, which is Santeria. Satanic worship is very, it's a contentious issue because there are dark sides to all of the practices, without a doubt. Every, even in religion, you get dark, good and evil. You get demons and angels. Um, satanic worshipping, I don't think, is anything to do with voodoo. Um, it's more to do with Christianity than it is to do with voodoo, because there isn't, in voodoo and Santeria and Condomble and Obia, there isn't that ideal idea of a devil as such as we have it's not that black and white and that binary okay thank you um from eglantina some authors link voodoo catholicism not only in africa um yeah food catholicism was used to overshadow a sl across mm -hmm. the world catholicism was the religion that was deemed to be 
appropriate for slaves to be baptized into. So wherever slaves, and that, that happened, it was in places like Brazil, across the Caribbean, and other places where Catholic, the Catholic faith was then imposed on slaves. So wherever slaves went, you tend to find Catholicism is linked to voodoo. And voodoo is generally used to cover all of these religions, even though it's not, it's used as a general term. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and from Juliana, could you repeat St. Patrick's voodoo counterpart, please? Yeah, St. Patrick's is Dambala, um, sometimes spelt D-A-N, sometimes D-A-M, B-A-L-L-A-H, but Dambala, because he's got his images of the serpents. Okay, thank you. And from Kat, um, she's interested in any food related to voodoo practices and culture, particularly of any native of foraged plants. Thank you. Um, I haven't... I haven't really looked into this other than the offerings. So white rice is quite common other than for, I will look at if, if you want to email me separately, that would be fine. And I, I will look, cause I've got lists and lists of the lower and what their food stuff is off the top of my head. I wouldn't be able to remember them all, but there are, a, there's a food stuff or, which could include plants, which is linked to every lower. So some are quite straightforward, it's rum or it's rice or potato, mm -hmm. but some are, are would be plants. So um, if, if you can email me, Kat, I'd be happy to send you a copy of the list of all the lower I've got. And there are many. Okay, thanks Louise. Um, Fumbelinus asks, do you know the significance of the shakers in ritual? Yeah, the shakers are, tend to be made from the gourd. <laughs> Um, so they're these, you know, they grow and they're, they're used. They tend to, sometimes they use snake vertebra on them, but it's just, again, part of that idea to bring sound together with the drumming to evoke the spirits. So to, to really wake them up and make them want to come and join in because the whole, uh, whole idea is to bring a spirit down to the material world to help. Mm -hmm. but they're beautiful and you you get them um some are made like i said snake vertebra or some are made from beads but they they are always part of the ceremony okay thank you and mocking jay just wanted to say thank you very much it was really interesting thank you um, and mary um thanks louise so interesting and so positive i've always been fearful of it so hollywood hollywood had worked a treat on me and there she says <laughs> um, Georgia, thank you for this very interesting talk. Do you have any academic books or studies that you recommend for further study on voodoo and its history, please? Georgia, if you could drop me an email, I will happily send you a reading. My PhD thesis is available online if you wanted to look okay. at it. <laughs> Just look for Louise Fenton, Representations of Voodoo, and you'll get the link. Uh, academic books, there are numerous, but in particular, I think as a starting point, there's one by Lena Herbon, H-U-R-B-O-N, called Voodoo, Myth and Reality, I think. It's only a little book, it's very small, but it is packed with history, it's got documents at the back, great, great starting point. Okay, and I think that answers the next question as well from Juliana, who says, very interesting, thank you. What would you suggest to begin reading up on um, voodoo and its history? So the things that you've just mentioned. Yeah, I definitely think Lenark Herbon's book is a great starter because it's beautifully, it's full of pictures and paintings and photographs and um, documents and it's divided really well. So it gives a thorough history and talks about the religion as well. Okay, wonderful. Um, Linda asks um, if she could have a copy of the recording um, and yes a copy of the recording will be available on the University Centre Telford YouTube channel um, so we'll put the links and everything on Facebook and, and let you know um, so um, that will be available thank you and Anna T says did they take elixirs during these ceremonies? No but they did take rum um, <laughs> not an elixir as such, but um, a lot of them do have a good swig of rum at the start because it, it, 
under the auspices that it's a, an offering to the spirits. They do spit some of it out onto the veve. Um, but no, it, it's really strange. It's that, I think if ever you get a chance, they're open ceremonies on, at Halloween in New Orleans. So if ever you're in, you get to go to the French Quarter in New Orleans, it's, they shut a road off and they do an, a proper ceremony. Um, and you will realise that the sound of the rattles and the drums and the chanting mm. really builds the momentum. And I don't think you would need an elixir. Fantastic. Um, so Kat, um, who asked a question previously, says that she's going to email and follow up on the question. Right. That's brilliant. Pamela says that from her own readings, she thinks that the idea of the voodoo doll is an offshoot from the use of puppets, occult or Wiccan roots, as Hollywood likes to merge things together. I'm thinking this is where that idea came from. Pamela, you've made me realise I did miss a section out on my voodoo doll section. Um, absolutely. It comes from European witchcraft. The idea of the pins in the dolls was purely a Hollywood creation. As I said, no Haitian doll has ever been found with pins in it. Um, it's also, it is from the word poppets. And that's, if you saw my talk last week, or I've got, I think I'm giving a talk in a few weeks about a cursed doll. Um, the use of poppets in witchcraft is specifically to harm, to stick a pin or a dagger into an effigy. Whereas voodoo doll, the only dolls found in Haitian Vodou are for healing. And yes, Hollywood does like to merge things together. I gave a talk, I think last year, um, on a, I think it was called Cultural Confusion. And it was this mix, mismatch of witchcraft, voodoo, black magic, Satanism, and how they've just sort of lodged it together and misled us for many, many years. Okay, thank you. More recommendations for further reading. So I think you've, you've done that. Again, one. Hannah, if you want to drop me an email and I'll put together a little reading list. I don't okay. know if we could post it somewhere, Paula. Yes, I... we could. Yeah, we could put it on Facebook or okay. on Twitter. Um, so yeah, that's fine. Um, and Pamela, just to say that she's enjoying the talk, hoping for more, and she was around for last week's too. So that's great to hear. Um, Xperia L3, um, did Vodou in Haiti change at all because of the 2010 earthquake or HIV crisis of the 80s? It, Vodou adapts, it changes, it, it morphs into other things and it's utilised for the current situation. The earthquake destroyed the cathedral which had beautiful paintings by Hector Hippolyte, um, very few of those survived but it emerges and it's used as a force. Bondier, who is their, who's God, they believe that everything is God's will and anything else, that everything that happens is for a reason and they then turn to the spirits. So although it may change, you see appropriations of American culture in the 1980s in particular, um, but it's still, there's a well-known saying, it's 80% Catholic, 20% Protestant, and 100% Vodou in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably a fair, a fair account. Okay, um, another thank you from Deborah saying thank, thank you, you for a really interesting lecture. Um, Eric is um, suggesting Thora Neil Hurston's book, Tell My Horse. That's Zora. It should be Z O R A, but Zora, Zora Neale Hurston. Zora. Yes, definitely. She was an anthropologist and a, a black academic. Um, her life in itself is fascinating, but she wrote some amazing books. Okay, and another comment about the link between the voodoo doll as a means for harm, taken from puppets and witchcraft. Yes, definitely. That's it exactly. Yeah. Um, Fumbelina. Uh, thank you so much for this. I have a pair of shakers given to me from a friend from a holiday. They're beautiful, but very like the ones in the video. Um, so presumably from... Um, Somewhere in the Caribbean, I would imagine. Yes. Um, Mary says, are the Haitians angry about the way their religion has been distorted and degraded? As Absolutely. It and you can understand why. And... Although tourism obviously has now stopped altogether, um, tourism became quite, when tourism was open in Haiti, um, people wanted to see ceremonies. But if you think about what I've talked about, how it was persecuted, even in the 1980s, there was an anti-superstition campaign to burn and destroy any voodoo mm -hmm. temple or peristyle. 
they're angry about the fact their own government has persecuted them and the West has persecuted them, compounded by the fact that Hollywood has created a version of voodoo, which is nothing to do with Haitian voodoo. And I'm hoping that over time, as people like me sort of speak out and show people what it's about, the tide will turn. But we've got centuries of misrepresentation and racism to overcome. Okay, thanks, Louise. Um, Sarah says, have you seen more dolls in Vodou who represent the, the Loire? No, um, no, it's really interesting. There's an artist called Piero Barra, B-A-R-R-A. -R -R he died a few years ago, but he made, he was believed to be a bokor, who's a, a priest of the dark arts of Vodou. And he created these beautiful artworks, which featured a lot of dolls. And he believed that the dark spirits led him to make the artwork. He, he was guided by his spirits. So although they don't represent a specific lower, his artwork is very dark and represents the Gede spirits or the spirits of the dead using dolls. So you will see them included in some imagery although not as in a specific representation. Occasionally you might find a statuette of Mary um, for a zeli on an altar, but not very often. Okay, thank you. Um, all the way from India, thank you so much from Tanvi for the invigorating talk, gratitude from India. Oh, so thank you. That's lovely to know that um, we've obviously got a worldwide audience again. Um, Josephine says, could you send us the link for the recording? So yes, we will post it on University Centre Telford Facebook um, page um, and it will um, give you the link for our YouTube channel, but it will take us a little while um, to get it edited and everything, but it will be there. Um, so that's fine. Um, and then the next one is similar. How do we find Louise's email? Where will the recording be posted? Um, so that will be on our Facebook page. And just if you are listening, my email address is just louise.fenton at wlv.ac.uk. Okay. Or just look me up on the University of Wolverhampton, you'll find yeah. me. Yeah, okay, thank you. Now the next one is a, a, is a very long comment and then some questions. Um, from Steph, thank you very much. That was absolutely outstanding. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and learned so much. Previously studied law and done my dissertation on human trafficking. Uh, quite often in my research, when there were reports on people being trafficked in the modern age from Africa, um, quite often in my readings, such as UN reports discussing the matter, they often referred to some modern slavers of trafficking victims would control or make them live in fear by using witchcraft and voodoo. Do you think such reports made of this have completely misunderstood voodoo and are thus misrepresenting um, this peaceful re religion and creating a bad representation of voodoo by people who are getting the wrong idea of it? Perhaps getting more experts from voodoo and the matter of human trafficking is needed in future to prevent misunderstandings and discrimination. That's a really interesting question, Stefan. I could probably talk to you for hours about this. Um, there are dark sides of voodoo, without a doubt. And you have to understand that there are people who are believers and followers of voodoo that no curses exist. They believe that, especially, especially in New Orleans, people are incredibly superstitious. And if they see a chicken's foot buried under their front door or some symbol, they are incredibly frightened and there are there are scientific evidences of voodoo what are called voodoo deaths where people have been so frightened that they've been cursed they died although there's no scientific link between an object and the curse and the person they've still died voodoo and witchcraft are feared because there are priests called bokors who are believed to practice the dark arts and in the case of slavery, I think some of it is misunderstood and automatically it's jumped on whenever there's something that's a bit sinister or a bit different or markings are seen, you know, we're contacted to say, is this witchcraft, is this voodoo? And it's not, it's somebody just doing something a bit weird. Mm. Um, so there is that misunderstanding, but there is also a cultural element which does instill fear. So I hope that kind of talks, but please email me and I'll be happy to have a chat to you about it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. 
Great, thank you. Um, just a request for the reading list to be on Facebook um, uh, as well as Twitter from somebody who doesn't do Twitter, so that's fine. Um, Xperia L3 again asks, is there anywhere in the UK that sells Haitian um, voodoo art? There was and it closed, it was in Bristol. Mm -hmm. um, there was only one place, which is really frustrating and perhaps I ought to uh, look into it. There are a lot of online stores, um, most are run from the States, but I would just stress, check the integrity of them because there are quite a few that exploit. Obviously, buying art in Haiti is very cheap. They then mm -hmm. inflate the prices and make huge profits. Mm -hmm. But I believe there is, there is an art gallery in Haiti, an American move there, but she runs an art gallery from Haiti. She does put a premium on the artwork, but she supports local artists in Haiti. Mm -hmm. So I would probably look at Haiti as the initial yeah. place okay. for beauty art before you start looking on the American market. Yeah, okay. Um, and Anna T, um, so she, she's been to New Orleans and visited the museum there was a priest who showed us an albino snake which goes around the necks of a marriage couple at the time of their wedding to understand one another better they seem to use snakes a lot why thank you okay the snake you're talking to is actually called Jolie Blanc and I've oh. had around my neck oh, wow. <laughs> it's incredibly <laughs> heavy she's died she and sadly she died a few years ago um mm -hmm. she was huge so I'm glad you got to see her because the, there is still a shrine to her um oh. Jolie Blanc they do use snakes a lot and that's because in West Africa and some of the beliefs do use snakes um Dambala as I said a lot of the spirits in Vodou have snakes um, serpents are, you know, it's that idea of the, the never ending, you know, you've got the tail and the head and that perpetual eternal life and death. Um, but it originates in West Africa and then in New Orleans, especially at the museum, um, Mr. Gandolfo, who runs it, he, yeah, Jolie Blanc was his and um, um, yeah, no longer with him. Okay, and one final question from magenta will you be talking on wicca witchcraft and the occult um, okay um well hopefully we've got to talk about what else i can talk about <laughs> uh, zombies is obviously one that's come up a few times yeah, yeah. Uh, I've written quite a lot on zombies and how they evolved but I'm happy to I'm happy to keep doing the talks. I am doing a talk for the university as part of Arts Fest on the cursed dot one of the cursed poppets from the oh. collection of the Museum of Witchcraft, and that's on the 15th of July at 5 p.m. Okay. So if you, if you look on Arts Fest University of Wolverhampton, you should be able to find it. Brilliant. And that's on Zoom as well, isn't it? Yes, it will be. I've requested it's on Zoom, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. And that's all the questions, I think, Louise. Okay. All 32 of them. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so thank you ever so much, Louise. That was fascinating as ever. Um, I learned so much there. And like Mary, I was um, somewhat afraid, I think, of, of voodoo. And that's really um, allayed my fears, I think. So thank you. And thank you very much to everyone who's attended as well. And so many um, people asking questions. Um, it makes such a difference when we have so many people who are engaged and really interested and passionate and from mm -hmm. all around the world as well. Yeah. So um, we'll liaise with Louise and hopefully there'll be further talks. Oh, I can just see another oh, couple some, of <laughs> some last minute comments. Oh, just thank you. Yes, I thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, thank you, and a thank you from Xperia L3 as well. So, well, I'd uh, like to extend my thanks to everybody that's sat and listened. As I said, it's a very strange experience not seeing any audience and talking to a screen. Um, and thank you, Paula, and all the team at UTC for all their support. And it's it's great to get all this work out there. Yeah, it is fantastic. Thank you once again, Louise, and thank you to everybody who stayed with us. Um, and um, Hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank um, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.